Hey there, Pastor Mark here. It's our prayer that this message would encourage and equip you in your relationship with Jesus. We're able to provide this content due to the joyful generosity of our financial partners. And if you'd be willing to join that tribe and help get some sermons like this around the world, you can donate at harvestbaptist.info slash give. God bless. Hey there, we covered nine verses last week. We looked at the, the power and the peril of pride. And this morning we're going to see furthermore why God is pronouncing judgment on this country of Edom. Edom being the descendants of Esau. And this country of Edom, we'll see, it's not just because of their pride, but it's also because they are attacking their brother, Jacob. So the Esau brings about the Edomites, Jacob brings about the Israelites, and now the Edomites are against or attacking the Israelites. So this sermon today has, uh, honestly, a lot to do with current events. Uh, It has over the last few months, but even as of yesterday, with some new attacks uh, through drones and missiles on Israel, like this text, I believe, speaks into that in some very clear ways. And I think it would be fitting this morning for us actually to to start by uh, doing what the psalmist called praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, We're going to talk broadly, but we'll specifically hone it in on Israel towards the end of the sermon. And I think it just may be fitting for us to stop and say, Lord, bless us and speak to us, but to also uh, pray for what's happening right now in the Middle East. So if you join me in that, uh, we'll dive into Obadiah here in just a minute. Father, we're grateful to be here today. We're grateful for our freedoms. We're grateful that we do not have uh, air raid sirens sounding in the distance. We're grateful uh, for your word. And we ask that you would speak to us. We ask that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. But Lord, we also pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Not just the peace, but we pray for our allies in Israel that you would protect them, that you would bring peace to them, that you would preserve them, and that, you, that your hand would just be very evident in these days. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are going to talk about poetic justice this morning, and we're going to talk about poetic justice because of Obadiah 1 verse 15. And this will be the end of, of where we get to this morning. We're going to cover verses 10 through 15. But verse 15 says this, for the day of the Lord, and the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. It's not exactly something you would, you would want if you don't know God. The day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done Edom, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. When we speak of poetic justice, it's difficult to understand poetic justice if you don't understand poetry. And to understand poetry, I'm going to take you back to 1999. I am in sixth grade, and I had a sixth grade teacher by the name of Kit Williams. Uh, Kit Williams was just wrapping up her PhD in teaching, and it was unusual to have someone with their PhD teaching elementary at a private Christian school because she could have taught in a lot of places, but that's where she wanted to be. And we thought, we thought we were so clever as little, you know, 11 year olds. We called her Dr. Kitty. That was our name for her. And so Dr. Kitty was our teacher and she was truly a profound teacher. She pushed us and stretched us, but was fantastic in so many ways. I can remember doing a research paper for the first time. And most, most of the time you won't do a research paper to in high school, but we in fifth and sixth grade did thousand word research papers. I can still remember what I did them on. The Iditarod Trail, which is the world's longest dog sled race, and John James Audubon, the great American painter. If, uh, if you want all the deets on John James Audubon, I'll tell you. You can ask me uh, after the sermon, after service today. But those were principles that I legitimately still employ to this day on what it means to go uh, to multiple resources and find information and take that and coalesce it and put it in one thing. It's, it's like sermon preparation, really. I can remember that she somehow, somewhere read that 
people's brains worked better and their test scores went up when they listened to classical music in the background. So she had a CD that she would put on every time we took a test. And the CD was called Mozart Makes You Smarter. And she was the first person to get me hooked on classical music. And to this day, I probably listen to about 20 hours of classical music a week because if I'm doing deep work, I prefer to have uh, Yo-Yo Ma or some sort of Mozart or something in the background in my ears and in my head still to this day. But she was, in my estimation, most profound because she would teach our curriculum that was meant to be spread out over four quarters in three And I had her for fifth and sixth grade in both years. We finished. She didn't like shortcut the curriculum. We did it all, but we did it in three quarters. And it left our last quarter with our core classes. We no longer had math. We no longer had English. At the end of quarter three, we would do what you do at the end of the year. Like we'd throw our books in the trash. I mean, we'd be done with it. And she would do whatever she wanted. We had a yo-yo class where we all got yo-yos and we, and we learned different moves and we practiced. We had sign language class. We had speech class. We had a creative writing class. Uh, we had checkers and chess, but we also had a poetry class. And I can remember, it's the only poetry class I've ever had, but I still remember the basics of what's the difference between a sonnet or a couplet or a haiku or some of these sorts of things. One of my friends, actually my best friend growing up, really took to it. And he actually started writing lots of poetry. He got several of his poems published by the time he was in eighth grade. And poetry class was like impactful for him in in a profound way. But you learn in poetry that something is poetic for a lot of reasons, but it, to put it in my own simple way, things just tend to resolve themselves. Things tend to begin to feel right. It could be the parallelism that is, that is in, uh, the, in the poem itself. It could be the meter that's being used. It could be the rhyme. We would know poetry most specifically for the, the end of this line, rhymes with the end of the next line sort of thing. But it just feels fitting. Poetry doesn't feel clunky. It feels like it fits together. It feels very fitting. And when we say poetic justice, what we mean is justice has been served to an individual, to a corporation, to a nation, and that justice feels fitting. It feels like they deserved it. It feels right that they got slapped upside the head. It feels right that justice was served. That's poetic justice. And Obadiah tells us that when the Edomites are punished by God, and this whole little snippet is this, is this prophecy of doom and gloom for Edom, that this will be poetic justice. That you are getting what you gave. It's coming back around like a boomerang. It's very similar to the ancient agrarian concept of you reap what you sow. That this justice from God and this wrath from God is very fitting for them. And we saw last week that they were going to be punished first because of their pride. But this week you'll see an altogether different subject that they are going to be punished for their violence towards Israel. If you would read it with me in verse number 14, or 10, excuse me, verse number 10. Here is why God has come and said, I'm going to judge you. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Jacob is another way of saying Israel. Same guy, different names. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee. And thou shalt be cut off forever. You have taken up arms against Israel, your brother. You've even, we'll see in a minute, taken up arms against Israel's non-combatants. And for this reason, you are toast. And we know now with history on our side that this prophecy was in fact true, that they were cut off forever. I know this because raise of hands, who has eaten at an Edomite restaurant recently and you've had some good Edomite food? Anybody have a neighbor, a friend, or or a relative who's an Edomite? Nobody. And I know nobody because they've been cut off forever because that country is no longer their country. That lineage of people has been amalgamated into other different people. And it is no, there are no more Edomites. There is no more Edom. It's done. And he says, it's because of your violence towards your brother Jacob. Verse number 11. 
In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast one of them. So this is speaking of Babylon coming, besieging, conquering Jerusalem for the first time really since David had taken Jerusalem uh, many, many years prior. That here they come, and this was ordained by God in judgment for Israel, because Israel has not been good. They have been a wicked and adulterous generation, and God has ordained Babylon to come, but he has not ordained Edom to jump in and to play a role in this at all. But they begin to insert themselves, and you're one of them who are against Israel. Verse 12, thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother and the day that he became a stranger. So in the day that they're being carried away as captives from their homeland, you should not have been a part of that. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. You're happy about it. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. All this calamity comes this w- their way and it puts a smile on your face and you jump in. Verse number 13. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. You're not just watching from a distance, you're coming in. You should have not looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You have, you've not just been an innocent bystander from a distance. You've not just been from a distance saying, yay, I'm so, I'm so glad you got what's coming to you. You've jumped in, you've begun to plunder them, you've begun to be a part of this. Verse number 14, this is the most condemning verse. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his, Jacob's, that did escape. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. So what's happening is Jerusalem is falling and like ants scattering from an ant hill, the women and the children and the people are fleeing now as refugees and Edom stood down in the crossways and in the thoroughfares away from the city and is picking off the refugees and is not just against them in word, but in action and is both killing them and is taking them captive and giving them back to Babylon and is not just, there's not just military forces at play, but you're literally taking the non-combatants. You're taking the women and the children and the pedestrians and you are attacking them and using them. And for this reason, you got it coming. Like justice is going to fall on your head, verse 15, and this justice is going to be poetic. This will be deserved. Now, inside of this text, you have a lot of principles at play, but I want to give you two principles that are timeless, classic principles. One of them will probably be very easy for you to wrap your head around and agree with and say, yes, amen. One of them will be more difficult for you to do that with, but both are here for us in this text. Principle number one is the response principle. Be very careful how you respond to the misfortune of another person, especially if that person is your enemy or that nation is your enemy or that church is your enemy or whoever. Be very careful to how you respond to their calamity because Edom has taken a task because they not only joined in, but they rejoiced when their enemy their twin brother, as it were, was down. So there's a lesson, first of all, in in familial ties here, because it is very uncanny to me how when someone has an enemy, that's one thing, but when their family becomes their enemy, it becomes like a behemoth of an enemy. Blood should be thicker than water, and we should have ties that bind, and those ties should be our family. But it is always not just discouraging to me, sometimes depressing to me, when families go from loving each other and for each other to now against each other. And in my experience, that against each other is never moderate. It is always extremely heavy, extremely vitriolic, and extremely pronounced. 
and it shouldn't be. At its core, this is, you have two twin brothers who ward in the womb, then two twin brothers who ward in adulthood, and two twin brothers who their, their lineages continue to be Hatfields and McCoys and war with each other, and families are not supposed to war with each other. You're not supposed to do that to your brother or your sister. Parents are not supposed to be against children, and children are not supposed to be against parents. Brothers are not supposed to be against, be against brothers, and sisters are not supposed to be against sisters. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You say, you don't know my family. I know I don't know your family, but I know you, and I know that as much as lies within you, you should live peaceably with all men. Thanksgiving and Christmas should not be the place that everyone dreads and everyone fights. If, if you really don't have a lot in common and you think differently and it's an election year, oh, who knows what's going to happen this year? And then, look, 101% rule. 101% rule. Find the 1% you agree on and give it 100%. You probably agree on more than 1%, but find the 1% and give it 100% and get along with people. When they're your family, they're your family. It, it's your job to be a peacemaker in those situations. It's your job as parents to provide an environment in the home where your children don't war with each other. You do not want an environment where your children are sarcastic and snippy and fighting and constantly arguing and constantly against each other. I know they're close in age. I know they're the same gender. I know they're a different gender. I know that they're on the same sports team. I know, I, whatever it is. But as parents, it's our job, and I, kids aren't perfect, and you're going to have some fights, and you're going to have some squabbles. We're going to have this, for sure. But we want an environment where we say, listen, we're a team. We're a family. We are for each other. We cheer for each other. We encourage each other. We support each other. We love each other. We don't fight with each other. We're not at each other's throats. We're not putting each other down because we're a family. And here is Edom with their family, as it were, that is not only against them, but they basically smile while Israel is down, and then they kick Israel while they're down. And those, those are the two responses that you want to be aware of and you want to avoid, even if someone's your enemy. You don't smile when they're down and you don't kick them while they're down. You say, but you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they hurt me. This is poetic justice. They do deserve it. They played a stupid game and they're winning a stupid prize. And I'm real happy that they're winning a stupid prize. That's not the right response. I'm not saying don't be for justice. I am saying though, when you rejoice, when anyone is going through pain or suffering or calamity, even if they are your enemy, that is going to be bad. You're going to catch the eye of God in a way that you don't want. If you think I'm making it up, there's the Old Testament principle of this that's communicated to us in Proverbs, that he that is glad at calamity shall not be unpunished. You don't just get happy that misfortune befalls people. You have Proverbs 24 that tells us, and this is abundantly clear, honestly is in many ways a prototype for the Sermon on the Mount, that you rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and you let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Do not rejoice and do not be glad when your enemy is, is now having a tough go of it. Why? Lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he, God, turn, his, turn away his wrath from him. God may be giving them their just desserts, but you don't want to be glad at that. You say, then what am I supposed to do with my enemies? You know, let's just keep my enemies and be glad that I have enemies? No, no, no. You always want to get rid of your enemies. Always. I recommend you have a heart to get rid of your enemies, but there are two ways, and there's only two ways to get rid of your enemies. Destroy them or make them your friend. And what I'm saying is, you should want to make them your friend, not destroy them. You want to get rid of your enemy and you don't want your enemy to be your enemy. You don't want it to continue. You don't want the fighting to continue. You don't want the hurt to continue. You don't want the war to continue. You don't want to lock horns with each other all day long. You don't want that, but you don't want it to come by them just getting smacked down. You want it to come because you make them your friend. Don't we see this in the gospel? Aren't we very grateful that Jesus doesn't show up and be like, days of Noah, they're all dead, one family surviving. Aren't we grateful that we, 
who quite literally are not innocent puppies over in the corner that God is like, oh, I just can't help it. I love you so much. You're so cute. No, no, we're at enmity with God. Our sin has, has created not just a rift, but a division with us and God. We are at enmity with God, and God in that moment doesn't destroy us or even condemn us, but comes in Jesus to die on a cross and to be gracious and forgiving and reconciling and seeks to make his enemies his friends at extreme cost to himself. And we are grateful for that, right? And the idea is that we, as replicas of Jesus, now should have the same heart. And it's not easy. You would, you would put a lot of descriptors on the cross. Easy isn't one of them. So I'm not going to pretend this is easy. But it is the gospel lived out. You may be my enemy, but my goal is to reconcile. My goal is to pray for you. My goal is to see you become my friend so that we can stop this. I'm not saying let evil be evil and let evil be unchecked and just be like, yeah, whatever, who cares? Evil's, evil's happening. That's not the heart at all. But it is to say, let's stop that because they now come under God's authority and God's rule and they now are responding to the gospel. So now we're no longer enemies. You see this, of course, in the case of the Apostle Paul. Paul is an enemy of the church. Make no mistake about it. He is a terrorist in many ways against the church. Paul could have been struck with a lightning bolt and God just could have said, see ya. But no, no, no. Paul is converted. And now the enemy becomes the friend. Now the enemy becomes the ally. That is supposed to be our heart towards those who do not care or are not under the authority of God. You may be my enemy, that may be evil, but I do not rejoice in your calamity. I face those oftentimes as a pastor not a huge part of my job, but a small part of my job is to give counsel and advice when it is sought and at times when it's not sought. And that's never fun because unsought advice is seldom heeded and often resented. You just, it just normally doesn't go well, especially if your advice is on the heavier side. When you're trying to speak into someone's life as a shepherd lovingly and tell them, look, the path we're on is a road to destruction. This isn't going to serve your marriage well. This isn't going to serve your finances well. This isn't going to serve your children or your families well. And you're trying to warn them and help them. And more often than not, that is, that is not heeded. And more often than not, the warning that you kind of see, like I can, I've seen this play out before. I know this is headed. You're right more often than not, honestly. And you're left in those moments when you're right and now some destruction or some hurt or some pain has entered into their life to take a, you know what, play a stupid game, win a stupid prize, the end, or to try to have a heart to help them. But it's very easy, it's very easy to almost rejoice in their calamity and to say, I told you so, and feel kind of vindicated, right? Feel like you're proven right. Feel like and this pride can set in and it's very easy to rejoice in that, but I never want that to be my goal. The, the real heart is I hate that it had to come to this. Not you had it coming. No, it's I, I hate that it had to come to this. This can happen in churches. There are churches that I personally, or even we as a congregation would, dis, would disagree with on second tier issues, some, a variety of things, but they preach the gospel and they're a good church. I'm for them. I don't have to do everything the same. We don't have to look exactly the same. There could be some secondary stuff that isn't heretical. It's not the, the gospel. If they're preaching the gospel, I'm for you. There are some other churches that legitimately have doctrine that is heresy and they just don't preach the gospel. They exist. I'm not rooting for their demise. I'm rooting for their doctrine to get straight. I'm rooting for the ship to be turned around. I, I don't want heresy. I don't want a false gospel. But I'm not happy 
when, when, the, when the pastor implodes. I'm not happy when the church disintegrates. I would much rather the doctrine get straight and the church go forward and more people be reached for Jesus. That's what I'm rooting for. I, I remember this. I'll just confess my sin for a minute. I can remember shortly after 1999, you go forward just a little bit and you get to the terrorist attacks on 9-11. I'm a Christian, I've been around church my whole life and most of my buddies are too. I go to a Christian school, all those sorts of things. But you know what my heart was as a ninth grade young man when those terrorist attacks happened? Me and every one of my buddies had the same exact response. We wanna join the military. Let's sing Toby's Keys, courtesy of the red, white, and blue from the top of our lungs and nuke them all. That was our reaction. Let's join the military, nuke them all, and let, you know, you get it, and Uncle Sam has you at the top of his list. Like, that was it. Well, nuke them all, they don't know Jesus. Let them burn. Like, that was our heart. That's a, I, I, it's a normal response, but it's not a gospel-centric response. Do I want terrorists to continue? Absolutely not. But would I rather go Apostle Paul route? Now I would. There's a balance to be had where you do call evil evil, you do want justice, but at the same time, you're not rejoicing in someone's calamity, even if they are your enemy. You don't rejoice or smile when they're down. You also don't kick them while they're down. That was what Eden was guilty of. They rejoiced and then they joined in. They started kicking while they were down. They begin to add insult to injury. They begin to exploit the misfortune of somebody else. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 137 that God should remember the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, speaking of when Babylon went in and conquered. And the children of Edom said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. Destroy it, destroy it, burn it, burn it to the ground. Or we might say it this way, nuke them all. That was their heartbeat. Get rid of all of it. They're there being a cheerleader for the destruction. They're there provoking and prodding Babylon to go further and, and to do more destruction and to hurt more people and to take more captives. And it was for this reason that it, caught, it catches the eye of God and God says, I am done with you. You are going to be right, wiped out for this. There's going to be wrath that comes your way. You say, if, if, I'm, if I have an enemy and I'm not supposed to smile when they're down, and I'm not supposed to kick them while they're down, what am I supposed to do? I don't know. I mean, if only we had somebody that told us what to do with our enemies. Like, wouldn't that be great? It would have been fantastic if Jesus would have spoken into this and told us what our heart should be towards our enemies. Oh, I, I'm pretty sure he did, didn't he? Remember the Sermon on the Mount? What does he say? You've heard that it's been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I gotta, I'm gonna flip the script on that one, guys. I tell you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That's very against the grain. That is not easy. But that is a gospel heartbeat that my response to the calamity of somebody else should not be one of glee or joy, and it should not be one of wanting to join in and kick them while they're down, exploit their misfortune. I hate that it came to that. Sometimes it needs to come to it, but I hate that it came to it. I wish we would have gone a different way. I wish, I wish there would have been repentance. I, I wish there would have been conversion. I wish that is the Christian heartbeat. I don't know that it is the classic American cultural heartbeat, but it is the Christian heartbeat. You say, well, how can I do that when, like, there is legitimate evil? Like, you're, you're telling me just to stick my head in the sand and just go be good and shoot rays of shun, sunshine at everybody and just be happy and bless them? How can, you, don't, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they hurt me. Well, listen, I know somebody who, who does know. And you can't, you really honestly, you can't have the proper response if you don't understand the second principle. And the second principle is the retribution principle. God will deliver poetic justice when the time is right. 
you can't let go of your wrath and your vengeance and your vitriol and wanting to pay them back and wanting to be happy that they got their just desserts. You can't let go of that unless you understand what is at play with Edom right now, that there is a retribution principle that God will sort through it all and God will be just and God will pay it back if it needs to be paid back. This is found most profoundly in Romans chapter number 12, where we as the church are told, dear the beloved, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath or let go of your wrath. Do not take vengeance into your own hands. Do not be a vengeful person. Do not try to pay them back. Let go of your wrath. Why? It is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. I can let go of this. In many ways, I can submit the case to a higher court And now I am no longer the judge, jury, and executioner. I don't have to do that. I can submit it to God and I can let him sort that out. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that's abundantly clear. That's not hard to understand. It's hard to employ, but it's not hard to understand. But it is not my job to take vengeance into my own hands and be happy or root for or somehow participate in their destruction and what they had coming. It is my job to submit it to God and to go have a gospel heartbeat to whoever I can and to be a reconciliatory, reconciliatory, I don't even know the word, a reconciling presence. We'll say it that way. I want to reconcile people in this world. I want to be an ambassador for Jesus. Now, unless we get too far off the reservation, let me thread the needle and be clear. I am not suggesting that governments should not seek justice when just laws are broken. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that a government should say, well, let's just have a gospel heartbeat and whatever. Murder somebody, rape somebody. We'll give you $10,000 and say, God will sort it out one day. It, it'll all be all right. No, no, no. God has ordained governments and part of their ordination, according to Romans, which I'm sure we'll get in the Bible study on Saturday morning with Dave Whitcomb and Bob Barajas. Shout out to those guys that I'm sure we'll walk through this in Romans. Part of their responsibility is to, quote, bear the sword and be a terror to evil. It is the, the government's job to create just laws and to uphold those just laws. And we don't want to negate that. It is a parent's job to with your children, I've been on record for a long time saying, if you're a parent, delight in your children, love them, enjoy them, dialogue with your children, but discipline your children. Children need clear boundaries. And when those clear boundaries are crossed, they need consequences with teeth. Those consequences with teeth can vary, but children need discipline in their lives. They do with delight and dialogue. I'm not suggesting that if your 16-year-old sneaks out of the house, takes your car, runs it off the road and wrecks it because they had too much to drink, that you say, I'm going to have a gospel heartbeat and give you Kennywood tickets and bless you. And you know what? God will sort it out in heaven one day. No, that kid needs some discipline, right? They need a punishment at that moment in time. I'm not suggesting that bosses should just eliminate fireable offenses from their workplace and say it's, it's no holds barred, do whatever you want. You need a boss that has clear rules and when someone steps over that line, then there are consequences there, okay? Even churches have such a thing as church discipline. There are structures that God has put in place to create order and to eliminate anarchy. Those are valid. And for the record, those institutions are best when even when justice or punishment is is delivered, there's still a heart of, I hate that I had to come to this. I never hope anybody has to stand before a judge who gets some sort of weird delight after, for sentencing someone to prison. A good judge would say, it has come to this and here's your sentence, but I hate that it had to come to this. A good parent never delights in their discipline the old, it hurts me more than you, right? I, I don't enjoy this. I don't want to do this. A good boss would say, listen, 
you stepped way over the line. You're fired. And when the next potential employer calls me, I'm going to tell them the truth. That I'm not against you. I love you. and I love your family. I, re- I really do want this to change. Like, you still want that heart. But I'm, I'm talking, I'm not talking to governance authorities right now. I'm not, I'm not talking uh, to workplaces right now. I'm talking to you as an individual Christian. There are going to be many enemies. People that offend you, people that hurt you, people that use you, people that exploit you, people that speak ill of you, whatever. And it is your job to submit the case to a higher court and to live out the gospel in that moment and to have a, what was the word I couldn't say? Reconciliatory, whatever it is. To have that heartbeat. That's our job. And we can do that because we know he'll sort it. You even find this in the case of Jesus. Peter tells us that Jesus was able to take the shame and the punishment and the vitriol that he got on the cross because he committed to himself to him who judges righteously. That in many ways, Jesus submitted the case to his father and was able to take it and respond with, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do because of that heartbeat. And that's our job to live it out. Now, what you need to know is that this applies to anybody. When you, when you have a heart of retaliation or joy in their misfortune, that is not going to go well. And you will catch the eye of God and the ire of God. But there are specific groups of people that you will catch the eye and the ire of God in a unique way if you root against them or you start to join in on their misfortune or exploit them. There are at least three specific groups of people. There may be more, and if you know another one, shoot me an email, I'd love to know it. But there are at least three groups that God says, do not be against them. Do not mess with them. It won't go well for you. One is the Jewish people. There is a several millennia old principle that was given to Abraham where God told him, Abraham, I'm going to bless them to bless you. I'm going to curse them to curse you. And there's a reason he gave for it. Because Abraham, through you, I will be a blessing to all the nations. Right? God's idea from the inception was not, Abraham, you and your people, I want you to be a reservoir of my blessings and I'm just gonna pour blessings on you and you're just gonna get special treatment for the fun of it at the end. No, 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 you're not a reservoir for my blessings. I will pour my blessings out to you, but you are a pipeline and a conduit for my blessings because through you, I want to bless the earth. I want to bring a Messiah. I want to bring redemption. I want to bless you. So there is this principle, both that we should bless and not curse. The psalmist kind of echoes this sentiment in the Psalms when he tells us very specifically that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem and they shall prosper that love thee. Now, this is in our headlines right now. And this is, there has never been a, a nation in the history of the world that's done everything perfectly, okay? So I'm not, I'm not assuming that American people, Jewish people, anyone's ever done any, everything perfectly. But this is big time in our, in our headlines right now, has been for months, and will continue to be in a far more profound way with Iran sending drones and missiles over to Israel yesterday. Like that's, that's a very profound move. I was very grateful yesterday that immediately our president said unequivocally and unapologetically, Israel is our ally. We will come to their aid. We will come to our defense. That's good. And for, and for, A lot of administrations, we have had a lot of presidents and this has been something that has unified red and blue over the years. Israel is our ally, we will help them. We are against terrorists and those who fund terrorists. Like that's been pretty uniform. I was glad to hear that, not just because it's logical, not just because it's political, I was glad to hear that because it's biblical for us to be an ally to that nation. That is a good move for us in the eyes of God. I heard recently 
uh, ben Shapiro was asked a question, and whether you like Ben Shapiro or don't, I really don't care. Whether you even know who he is or not, I really don't care. But he's a Jewish guy, and he talks semi-logically a lot of the time about certain issues. But he was asked on this particular issue, will you condemn the Israeli attacks on Palestine in the same way that you will condemn the Hamas attacks on Israel? There are people dying on both sides. Will you say that this is even and they both deserve condemnation? And he wisely said, no, I will not. Because on one side, you have a terrorist organization that is sneak attacking a country and purposely targeting and kidnapping and murdering women and children. On the other side in Israel, you have people that are like, FYI, we're going to respond. You got a day or two to get out of your country. And I'm telling you, if you don't want to get caught in the crossfire, we're giving you ample warning. We don't want women and children or innocent civilians to be lost. There's a difference, right? On one side, you have you have a mosque terrorist who want to literally set up their fortifications or their bases under hospitals next to schools so that you can't target me without harming innocent civilians and are effectively using women and children as shields. On the other side, you have people who are doing everything in their power. It is a war, but they're, they're not trying to have collateral damage. There's a difference between those two. We should understand that there's a difference between those two and, and it should inform who your allies with. If you're, if you're just doing a coin flip on who to be an ally with and you have one group that doesn't want to protect women and children and another group that wants to try to protect women and children, go with the people who want to protect women and children. That's always a good rule of thumb. It doesn't mean that, that people are perfect and they're always good guys in that instance, but it's a good rule of thumb when you don't want to harm women and children and you want to protect them, which in other news is just a good lesson for all of us. If you're in a position of authority, if you're a dad, if, if you have any capability whatsoever to protect and to be strong so that women and children can be shielded and protected, then do that. That's a good move. But you have this at play right now where there are, there are attacks, there is violence against Israel. And in many ways, it's the only family feud that's longer than Jacob and Esau. The only family feud longer than Jacob and Esau, which is done now, is one generation prior. Jacob and Esau's daddy, Isaac, had a half-brother named Ishmael. Both have Abraham as dad. And you have Ishmael, who is, shouldn't have been there to begin with, May it be a lesson to us men that when you sleep with the wrong woman, it can cause hurt for generations. Abraham and Sarah both are idiots and try to solve their problem with, with a girlfriend and like get, get someone who's not your wife pregnant. Never a good idea. And here comes Ishmael. Here comes Isaac. Who's the son of the promise? Who's the one that the blessings flow through? It, it's Abraham was promised that through his son would come. Who's the son of the promise? And to this day, you have those from Ishmael and the Arab countries and the Islamic faith who claim Abraham as their spiritual father and say, we were the son of the promise. Then you have Isaac and the Jewish people and the descendants there who say, we are the son of the promise and claim it. And that, that feud has been going on for forever. And it's, it's honestly cute and adorable when an American politician strolls along and is like, I'll solve it. We'll sit down and have two days of discussion and the peace accords and it'll all work out just fine. It's like, eh, probably not. This, this is a long history. And that's still happening. In many ways, it is the brother and the half-brother still fighting each other. And what God says is this shouldn't be for your violence. You will, you will be corrected. So be very, very careful to not bless but curse Israel. You, you have in many ways the same principle applied to the Christian church in 2 Thessalonians. In the same way that God wants to have a reservoir for blessings, not, but a pipeline and a conduit for blessings, you have really the church. You find these words in 2 Thessalonians that God speaks to the church and says, 
It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. This is a curse them that curse you verse. It is very righteous and very fitting for me to bring calamity to the people that are troubling the church and to you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now there is a lot that's there and that is extremely heavy, but suffice it to say, when you mess with the church, it's not a good idea. In God's eyes, you catch his eye and you catch his ire in profound ways. You have, we just last year walked through the book of Revelation. And the, the core of Revelation, the middle, the chunk of it, is really an expansion of this, of people messing with both Israel and those who know the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's judgment and wrath falling on them. And it's a heavy read, but it is, it is this principle played out that God will deliver poetic justice when the time is right, you can rest assured. There's a third group of people and we'll be done. And we'll just classify it as the vulnerable. You would see most specifically, if you wanted to be concrete about who are the vulnerable, widows, orphans, immigrants, the poor, and children in general. Where we as God's people are instructed, even the Jewish people were instructed to take special care for these groups, to have a special heartbeat for them and love for them and a, a, a proper social concern as it were for these groups because they are easily manipulated and easily exploited. They're, they are far more vulnerable than many other groups. This isn't true in every single instance, but broad brush, customarily speaking, widows and orphans and children and immigrants and those who are poor are set up to be taken advantage of in ways that nationalized citizens and those who have money and are affluent and those who are older with some maturity, they, they have some resources at their disposal to guard them from being exploited and, manip and manipulated. So you will find on one hand, God saying, bless them. True religion undefiled is what? To visit the widows and the fatherless in their affliction. That's pure religion is to love on them. Or you would find the opposite. Let the little children come to me. But I'm telling you, words of Jesus, it'd be better that we tie a dumbbell around your neck and dump you in the ocean than you harm one of these little kids. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. There is this special concern from the heart of God to look at people that are especially weak or vulnerable or people that are perhaps falling out of the fabric of society and a Christian's job is to weave ourselves into their lives and to help them not exploit them or use them. Here's the sermon in a nutshell. We should have a non-retaliatory, loving, gracious, generous, bless our enemy's heart because we can rest assured that a just God We'll sort it all out one day and we don't have to make that our job. We can have a very limited, simple job description that is to bless them and to love them. And if you get off kilter with that, if you begin to smile at their calamity, even if they were wrong, if you begin to kick them while they're down, even if they oppose you politically, it's bad news bears. You don't want to do it. And you will especially especially reap the wrath of God if you mess with Israel and you mess with his church and you mess with the vulnerable. But God does not take that lightly and he do, it doesn't get by him. You will not pull one over on him. Now I know that that's a heavy thought, but I hope that it could be an encouraging thought because I, I really do believe that the world is looking for someone or some group of people that know how to handle evil and problems in the world in a different way. Because us ranting on Facebook about it all day long 
and wanting to constantly clinch our fists at everybody is not working. And I really believe that there's an opportunity for the church to be the church and for people to see something that is different and attractive and winsome and be so like, I, I, don't, I don't agree with you on everything, but have mercy. I, I'd hate to think what the world would look like without you and without your heart. I mean, I, I like that. There should be a magnetism here and there's an opportunity here for God's people to be God's people and to take a true gospel-centered heartbeat into the world. Pray with me if you would. Father, we love you. May we take some simple principles that are so hard and may we live them out in our lives. God, may we trust in you for justice. May we work for justice, but may we also personally want to make our enemies our friends. Instead of fighting all the time, may we love more. God, I would, I would never want to pastor a church where we couldn't call evil, evil, or we couldn't proclaim the truth. But I would also never want to pastor a church where we're so truth-driven that we forget to love. May our hearts sink when our enemies fall. May we say, I wish it didn't have to come to this. Would you use us in this world to be reconciling ambassadors for you? Jesus, we thank you for befriending us in many ways, for forgiving us and for reaching out. We did not deserve it and we were in the wrong, but you reached out anyway and you loved anyway. May we remember this and may we respond to this. I want to take a moment and allow you just an opportunity to pray, talk to the Lord. If he's spoken to you, talk back to him. If you're fighting with your family, he'll seek to change that. There's probably some pride involved, so maybe confess that and take a humble approach to your family. If you're constantly rooting for someone else's demise, I don't know how to say it other than bluntly, like confess that as sin and ask God to help you change it. If you're in the room and you don't know Jesus as your savior, I don't know that I could put it any better than he wants to reach out and make you his friend. Our sin is an offense to God. There's no way around it. But God is willing to forgive it. He's willing to clean it. He's willing to reconcile us and redeem us. In many ways in the cross, Jesus offers an olive branch, but you can't reject his olive branch. You've got to take it. He dies for your sins and he raises from the dead. Would you accept it? In so many ways, an offer of, of friendship and forgiveness. If you never have, then right where you sit, call out to him. Say, Jesus, I accept your offer of forgiveness and friendship. I want to be reconciled to you. Jesus, I'm putting my faith and my trust in you. I'm asking you, forgive me of my sins. Clean me of them and redeem me, I pray. I would never want to be your enemy. Tell him that you believe that he died for your sins. Tell him that you believe that he rose from the dead and put your faith in him.